Hello, protocols, packets, and programs. Do you enjoy battling threats with weird names, manipulating characters and classes, handling polymorphic types and void stars? AppSec is the right place for you. But if you want all that plus rolling dice, check out the Dungeons and Dragons Spelljammer update. It comes out tomorrow. Which means this week we chat with Tanya Janka about good AppSec that doesn't have to be perfect and what that can look like in CICD pipelines. In the news segment, looking at bounties, bugs, and browsers through a Microsoft lens, bounties through a strategic lens, and HTTP 1 through a new lens, and more. Visit Wildspace and stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. It's the show to learn the latest tools, techniques, and processes necessary to understand DevOps, application security, and cloud security. Your trusted source for the latest application security news. It's time for Application Security Weekly. Your organization is building and updating business-critical web applications faster than ever. And with so much pressure to move fast, you may find yourself making trade-offs between innovation and security. Now you can build fast without sacrificing security with Invicti, the application security platform that helps your dev, sec, and ops teams work together to secure every website, web app, and API. With unparalleled accuracy, coverage, and automation, Invicti scales like no other AppSec solution. Discover why many of the world's largest organizations innovate securely with Invicti. Visit securityweekly.com slash Invicti. ThreatLocker is a global cybersecurity leader paving the way for businesses everywhere to implement a zero-trust security solution that not only protects business-critical data, but also helps mitigate cyber attacks. ThreatLocker's unique endpoint solutions help you to work smart and strengthen your security infrastructure from the ground up. ThreatLocker's allow listing, ring fencing, storage control, elevation control, and network access control solutions give you a more secure approach to blocking the exploits of unknown application vulnerabilities. If you're looking to enhance your cybersecurity and stop zero-day vulnerabilities exploiting your data, reach out to a ThreatLocker cyber hero today. Visit securityweekly.com slash ThreatLocker to learn more. This is episode 208, recorded August 15th, 2022. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with John Kinsella. Hello, John. Good morning. I'm not a packet or a protocol, so um, uh, I'll try to act like a human. Oh, well, we need you to roll up a paladin, maybe, to keep the alliteration going. <laughs> so uh, we're also here with Joe South. Joe, how are you doing? Oh, it's uh, good to finally be over moving, <laughs> but now the long <laughs> process of unpacking. Uh, see, there we go. We got the packet reference. Uh, we also got one very quick announcement. Don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings at securityweekly.slash, or just go to securityweekly.com slash on-demand. One of those things will work out. But we also have Tanya Janka, also known as She Hacks Purple, is the best-selling author of Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. She is the Director of Developer Relations and Community at Bright Security, as well as the founder of We Hack Purple, an online learning community that revolves around teaching everyone to create secure software. Tanya has been coding and working in IT for over 25 years, won countless awards, and has been everywhere from public service to tech giants, writing software, leading communities, founding companies, and securing all the things. She is an award-winning public speaker, active blogger, and streamer, and has delivered hundreds of talks on six continents. She values diversity, inclusion, and kindness, which shines through in her countless initiatives. Hello, Tanya, and thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, all three of you. Well, we're also we can offer you a seventh continent to uh, to, to to round out that uh, <laughs> complete all the things. <laughs> but we are happy you're securing all the things. We're also happy you made it back from uh, Hacker Summer Camp in, in one piece. So congrats on that. And there's a lot of things that we could start chatting about. But one of the things that seemed most appealing was we can be we can have good security that doesn't have to be perfect, and it's actually still good and effective. Please tell us more. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I, I find, um, so I work with uh, lots of different companies doing consulting calls through this group called IANS Research. And so a lot of the household names that you've heard of, I have had the chance to meet their awesome AppSec teams. And quite frankly, it's cool. I get paid because, <laughs> because it's such an <laughs> opportunity to talk to so many amazing humans who are interested in what I do. And a lot of them, I find can be split down the middle between we want to be perfect versus we just want to be 
good. And so let me explain the difference. So let's say that you are doing top secret counterterrorism activities, or you are creating intellectual property such as the recipe for the COVID vaccine, things like that, you must be perfect, right? Um, you absolutely must have the best security you possibly can because there's literally lives at stake versus a lot of application security programs, they just need to be good. We want to defend against um, angstful teenagers in their mother's basement, sitting in the dark in a hoodie. They're like, I'm going to hack all the things because I like Metasploit. Um, no offense to Metasploit. It's not their fault. Sometimes people use it for evil. But the, the point is, is that you want to be able to defend against the non-advanced attackers. And most of the time, if you're just difficult enough to hack, they move on. They don't usually target a specific business. And if they do, they often, if it becomes too expensive and too time consuming, they just give up. And so ideally, if your security is just quite good, you can defend against almost all of those things. So if you need to be perfect, you need to defend against nation states and very determined, well-funded attackers. But the rest of us, we just need to make sure morons on the internet are after us. We need to make sure our security is respectable, security posture. And so when I talk to a lot of companies, sometimes I see, and I'd like to say this is like a minority of AppSec professionals, but sometimes I see ones where if it's not perfect, they just want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And they, they're just like, well, this thing missed one vulnerability in our hundred scans. So like, we're going to throw this product in the garbage. And I'm like, okay, so you're saying that, but when we look in your backlog, there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of criticals, thousands of highs, I can't even count the mediums, and you're concerned that this tool missed one low. And maybe what we need to do is instead spend more time working with our dev teams and our operations folks or our DevOps folks, depending upon how you do your stuff at your office, but working with them to help them make their apps more secure. So we don't have a ton of criticals and we don't have a ton of highs and we actually do have time to fix lows. I feel like sometimes the, the priority will be that we find every single vulnerability rather than finding almost all the vulnerabilities and spending a ton of time fixing them and a ton of time avoiding vulnerabilities in the first place, like through education, through way earlier scanning, through enabling the devs with, so when, when I was a dev, if someone told me, well, I'm going to write a policy and that's going to help you, I would be like, ha, 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 no, policies are annoying. <laughs> um, but since I've switched into security, you can, you can actually make policies that are really helpful. You can make, you know, a best practices for secure coding, for instance, or you can add security requirements when you're creating the requirements document for a new project, and that actually helps. And so I, I feel like I see, have you seen this divide, some of you? Have you seen this divide? Yeah, and I think you're you're hitting on a, a couple aspects. One, you start off, you know, that that aspect of the attacker cost. You know how there there's a certain call it the the, the bug bounty hunters who may just get lazy or move on because their scanner, their you know their DNS buster, their dir buster didn't find anything in particular that they know they can quickly monetize. So they'll move on to something else. I also want to throw in a, an ex, an additional dimension of what you were describing there about good versus perfect. All the critical vulns is just that how much can you just do basic patching? Because we've seen a lot of vulns have been compromised uh, or been exploited that have had patches available for one, three, and five years even. I think CISA, I forget, off the top of my head, I can't remember what their uh, metrics were, but they were pointing out five-year-old bugs that haven't been patched, that's pointing not to false positives from your scanner, that's pointing not to CVSS and CVE ratings, is pointing to why didn't you have a program to do that? So I'm curious, how, how do you either talk someone down from we must be perfect because we are, you know, we still want to be good stewards of people's credit card information, their personal data, but maybe we don't need to be spending every weekend, 12 hours a day on every single low vulnerability that comes in. So what, what's, what's that? How does that conversation unfold effectively? Quite a few phone calls that I take we're talking about, so they have a zillion vulnerabilities and they don't know what to do and they don't know where to invest their time. And they're like, do you think we should buy another tool? I'm like, no, I really don't think you should. And, and it sucks because I sell a tool or like I work for Right Security and they sell a tool. I do DevRel. I don't actually sell anything. But, 
but I do work for a vendor now. And that's not always the answer. Like if you have tons of vulnerabilities you found, but no one's fixing them, you need to look at why they're not fixing them. And Mike, you hit the nail right on the head when you said, sometimes the patching process is complete and utter. I hope it's okay to say the word hell, but that's what it is, right? Like where you have to go to 25 different meetings and you have to write, you know, tons of documentation and do all this crazy stuff so that you can push one change. That means developers and operations folks alike really held back from doing their job. So quite often what I'll do with companies is say like, we need to examine your patching process and your release process for custom code, because the reason why you have all of these critical vulnerabilities, like these ancient dependencies, et cetera, is because you've made it so difficult to release updates and you don't have any automated testing. You don't have any of the checks and balances in an automated way. And so then you're terribly afraid to release things to prod because prod is held together with like duct tape, bubble gum. There's like some spaghetti in there and yeah, it's very problematic. And they're like, Oh, you don't want us to buy another tool. I'm like, your money's your money. Like I'm just a, a consultant. Right. But I don't think find like having a, a, a fourth tool tell you, you have these vulnerabilities that you already know about. It's going to be helpful. Or even if it finds two or three more, you didn't know about have sex job is to ensure the software is more secure. It's not to find as many bugs as you can. It's not to be like, we have the coolest pipeline with 25 things in it. It's to try to release secure software. That's what we're supposed to do. So Tanya, we're all in security here. I think all of us have to believe in hell. That's sort of, that's our industry. Um, I want to back up a little bit on, because the way you start off actually is you're reminding me about, um, sort of the way I talk about some of this, right? Of, or the way I used to talk about this, where I want to bring it up. Um, is, you know, don't have to worry about the, um, uh, the, the kid in the basement or that type of thing. Cause remember like you'd stand in front of a room, like if doing a tra training session, I'm sure you've done this too. And someone always asks like, why is someone trying to hack me? And you're like, well, it's not you, it's someone's bored and they need to get, like you said, Metasploit. D do you feel that's still as much of a driver in 2022 or where there's so much automated attacks and bots and stuff like that going on? So I guess the, the question, I'm, I'm curious from your point of view. The, the thought around, are you seeing as much of like sort of still pointy, po pokey, sort of looking at someone in particular, or is it more that we're now sort of, how is the bots and the automation changing that I guess is where I'm going? I think there's more bots than ever before that are looking for really easy ways in. I think that, I think that that's gonna only become worse. And so unless you have some sort of system to toss those away, you're potentially going to have some problems or at least a bigger cloud bill. Like I'm often talking about APIs with clients and how we could try to slow down the bots, get the bots away, eventually turn them away. But I also think that, so this is going to sound really bad, but crime pays. It pays really well. It often pays better than legit work. And because it's so hard to do, um, I was going to say retribution, but that's not the word. Um, figuring out who the person is that did the work right? Like the person Your who did the attack. Yeah. Attribution, thank you. So figuring out who actually did the attack is so difficult. And the the pay, the potential payoff, if you manage to get in is so high. There's a lot of people, especially in countries where they don't have very many real job options. Like their economy is very problematic. Um, they basically like this is their, their main possibility for income, unfortunately. And so because crime pays so well and because it's so hard for them to get caught. And if they do get caught, it's like, oh, but you're an ocean away from us. How are we going to, you know, take you to court over this? Um, I think that that's only going to grow. We've seen, so I, I don't mean to be fear, uncertainty and doubt on everyone, but I, I feel with certainty that it's going to continue to get worse until we make it too expensive. Like if it's just too expensive, generally world round, you have to be quite an advanced attacker to get anywhere. There'll be way less people. Like it, it's just like shoplifting in certain stores. If you have the mirrors and you have a camera and you have all of these other things, shoplifting goes way down. Um, it, yeah, basically right now there's a lot, there's a lot of sites on the internet with basically no defenses, um, really not secure code on top of that, no monitoring, no logging. So you're being attacked all the time. Client doesn't even know. The entire internet isn't like that, but a very, very large percentage is. 
And one of the things you were describing too, to, to tie that together to what you be the other topics or other points you were making is that a lot of what you're describing about, you know, tools, you don't need to spend more money on tools, don't necessarily need a lot more tools. And we don't need to make fun of tools the entire time here. But I think your point was more about less about the AppSec itself need to staff up or need to build out their their arsenal. It was more about you, you were describing just activities that developers need to do it's just you know go back to patching or doing some of the, the basic secure coding these are things that can happen independent of tools independent of an appsec team obviously it needs some guidance and education though so that's what a missing piece so i'm curious when you do talk to these companies and you're saying well you can spend your money if you want on these tools but that's not what your real problem is how much do you find yourself talking to the just the appsec side of the house versus the developer side of the house too you like meaning is is there a is there a missing connection there are we missing the chance to have conversations with the people that can make the actual changes so I would say that the AppSec team's job is to support the devs in making secure code. So that can mean helping them create a secure system development lifecycle. And when I say that, I mean adding security activities throughout the SDLC to help, to help them do better. And sometimes that means adding a tool. Sometimes that means, you know, doing a threat modeling session with them. Sometimes it means looking up this new technology that they're doing and come up with a list of security gotchas that you want them to avoid and a couple of best practices, you would really love it if they would do, right? And you support them over and over again. When I meet with consulting calls, it's always the security team because the way that IONS work is they make contracts with the security team, not the yeah, dev sure. team. However, when I do, um, so I work at Bright Security full time now, but I still do security training on the side. Um, so I do secure coding and AppSec training. And I would say for the secure coding training, one third of the time, it's the dev team that hires me. And quite often they'll say the security team wouldn't let us have training. The security team said it was too expensive. The security team said this or that. They're not helping us. We're afraid that we're going to do a bad job. And so I come in and, and this is going to sound really weird, but a lot of them are, are asking me, are there tools that you can get for us that are SaaS products or that are free or whatever so that the security team doesn't know we're using them because they won't <laughs> let us touch security tools because that's their job. But they're only running scans once a year and they, you know, hire a pen tester, but only for like our two most important apps, but we support 200 apps and we want all of them to be good. And we're so worried that will look stupid. We're so worried we'll make a mistake. And so we want you to come in and help us basically form our own secure SDLC without this, on top of this, making sure it can be hidden from the security team because the security team will disable their tools because that's their job, not your job. And you will not interfere with our security program. And it's really, I feel like they seem like little puppies that have been kicked. They're like, we just want to do a good job. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry, your security team is having some issues and doing things the old way, but let's find some solutions for you, right? And so I feel like software developers are more concerned than ever before about making sure their apps are secure, which to me is awesome news, right? Because like you said, Mike, they're, they're the ones. They're the ones whose attention we're trying to get. Like, they're my customer. When I do AppSec, I'm trying to just support them and help them. Without them, I'm totally lost. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, I'm just shaking my head at the idea that sounds so much like a, an anti-pattern of job security as opposed to application security. Not not the focus we want to hear from a, from an AppSec team. I want to dive more into that training aspect, though, because that's one of the things that we love to talk about and possibly don't talk about enough. Maybe one of the, my first questions is, developers are coming to you, they ask you, what are some of the surprising questions they have? Or what, what are the things that you find this is the the, the, the highest value topic for, for a training item? Okay, so the first thing that I start with is I reinforce the security team's lessons, assuming I'm working with the security team and they hired me. So I'm like, what have you been having the most problems with? Because I want to highlight those. Do you have a new tool or a new thing coming? I want to highlight that. I want to support your initiatives. So that aside, then when we get to the actual secure coding part, the first thing is input validation. Mike, 
people are still getting this so wrong. It's 2022. And when I, as a dev, like it's been like, I think nine years since I was full-time programming and designing software. So that's a long time. Um, I did all the mistakes. Like I was like input validation. Yeah. Like from a search field, but also the input parameters. Also the stuff you got from that API. Also the stuff you got from that database that isn't yours. Also, also, also. And, and I also, unfortunately, used to do more of a block list approach rather than an approved mm. list approach. So I would say like, oh, these characters are bad. If you got these characters, no way. But now that I work in security, I know it's the opposite. Make a list of what you want. So as soon as I started pen testing, Mike, I was like, oh my gosh, what have I done? I need to go back and reprogram all my old apps. Um, because th the best practices, um, so I went to college in the 90s. There was no security class whatsoever, right? So I had to learn it kind of on the fly. And if you're a dev, are you going to take a security training class that's seven or eight or nine or $10,000? Are you going to take the $1,500 class that's about that cool new front end JavaScript framework? Obviously, I would take that when I was a dev. <laughs> and so, um, so I had to kind of like learn these things slowly on the fly. And when we do... So if everyone on the planet did input validation for every single piece of information that their app took in, and then once it's trusted and you're sure it's what you're looking for, then they made actions or decisions or did whatever they're going to do, I predict that half of the vulnerabilities on the internet would be gone. And I know a lot of people are like, Tanya, that's a huge number. I'm like, right? It is. <laughs> like inje injection would be done. Cross-site scripting would be done. Like this huge list of things would just be over, but it's hard and it's every single time, right? Like sometimes I would pen test things and just to be clear, I was middle of the road. I was not a super skilled pen tester. I would like take my web proxy and be like, pew, 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 pew. Um, <laughs> I was not an amazing, amazing pen tester, but I would find like, oh, you did input validation on six out of these 10 inputs. Mm -hmm. Did you get tired then? Like, did you? So, so Tanya, <laughs> and, okay. and you wrote each one. <laughs> Sorry. Let's, let's keep focusing on this one because I think this is the one of the things I like doing on the show is is trying to um, is education aspect, right? So how how do we either talk to security people about getting those the, the good security? Well, the security people who are seeing the, the the light, we're all good, right? But the security folks that are trying to help out other appsec people, or excuse me, other other application developers, are like. So the question I'm going here is. Um, when you made that jump, what would you go back and tell old Tanya? Like, how would you go about finding, how, how would you go about making sure you didn't do those input validation issues? Is, was it, what was the learning curve like for you? Was it like a, oh, I should have been looking at this instead? Or was it really as you started testing your own applications or what was the light? Basically, I was in a band and then there was a pen tester in my in my office and he was in a band, so our bands had to play together because that's how musicians work. That's how we make friends. And then he spent a year and a half hassling me that I needed to join security because security was the best. And I was like, I'm a software developer. I am the king. I'm the emperor of IT. Like I make something out of nothing every day. Go away. Nothing can be more fun than this. And then slowly he kept showing me cool stuff. And I was like, damn it, that is really cool. Um, and so it actually took quite a long time. So I started as a pen tester and very quickly I realized that was not the right spot for me because I couldn't let go. I couldn't end the engagement. I'd be writing the devs like, hey, this is how you fix that. Like, tell me if you need help. And my boss was like, Tanya, stop, stop that, stop that. Engagement's over, leave them alone. I'd be like, oh, I'm going to show up early and we're going to threat mail. They're like, no, stop doing that. Stop doing that. That's not part of the contract. Um, so I'd like to note I was really annoying for my boss. Um, <laughs> and so then I found out AppSec was a job, but there was no book about AppSec. There was no course I could take. There was no, you know, I couldn't go to university and learn it. And so um, since I started in AppSec years ago, I wrote a book about how to do AppSec. And it's called Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. And then I started We Hack Purple. Um, and We Hack Purple, my goal was to make affordable security training. And now um, we got purchased by Bright Security. And as a result of this wonderful news, all our courses are free online. So if I now was going to try to get into something, I would just join the We Hack Purple community. I would take all the courses for free. And then I would join 
like all sorts of AppSec communities, like OWASP, DevSecCon, um, Sec for Dev. There's all these like awesome little groups that you can join, make friends, network, and learn. But back in the day when I started, um, I joined OWASP. I, I'm, I'm their biggest fangirl. Um, <laughs> and I became a, a, a leader of our chapter very quickly because I was like, oh, if I'm the leader, I can help choose what we're going to learn about. I could start inviting cool people. And then I found out if you apply to a conference and you get in, you get a free ticket. Um, <laughs> and so then the whole reason I started speaking at conferences and applying all over the world, because I just wanted to learn for free. I was like, jokes on you, losers. I'm going to get like learn from all these awesome other speakers. All I have to do is spend like 500 hours doing research and writing a talk. But for me, that was like a way in. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Let's 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 take you back to that college of the '90s, though. Still, and you know, the, it at least the '90s at least gave us grunge, Nine Inch Nails, OWASP didn't even exist. We didn't even have the OWASP top ten until early 2000s. So, correct. You know, what was there to learn for or learn from? But as Tanya, the early developer, would you? What would have convinced you to sit down and actually? read this policy that maybe uh, John, Joe, and I threw your way, or, or we say, hey, Tanya, we want to do some threat modeling. Uh, would that, you know, what, what, what's the human aspect of that that would have gotten you interested that in more so than just you are supposed to be writing secure code, you know, some, something very dry like that? I feel like in the late 90s, security wasn't taught or thought about because it wasn't a big problem. There weren't that many malicious actors that knew how to attack anything. Um, I remember I had this friend named Jeff and he was a programmer. I law programmer friends, a law musician friends. And he was both. And he had figured out how to hack ICQ so he could turn off his brother's ICQ because he, they're in a fight. <laughs> they're teenagers. He's like, ha ha ha, stupid Chris. Um, and he would just do all these things to mess over his brother's computer. And I found this very humorous because we were, he is the little brother and I was the little brother's friend. We're like, ha ha. Um, but I remember thinking like, oh, like, where did you learn that? And he's like, on the internet. I'm like, oh, the internet's pretty big. There's like some stuff in there. <laughs> And I honestly, I just wanted to make things and solve problems and help people. And I didn't view security as helping until much later. I viewed it as restricting. Mm -hmm. um, briefly in 2007 and 2008, I did counterterrorism activities for Canada, which obviously I can't tell you a lot about, but I, I thought it sucked. It's like, this is awful. I'm not like, I'm not enjoying this. I had to go for therapy after some of the things I learned and saw. And I was just like, oh, I never want to do security again. These guys suck. All they do is say no. All they do is tell me how wrong I am. All they do is like get upset with me all the time. Nothing I do feels good enough. And and also scary, scary, scary stuff. Um, and so then it took like years to convince, to have someone convince me back. But the thing that really did the trick was this woman named Alicia. So we started a project and there's this woman named Alicia in the project kickoff meeting. She's like, hi, I'm Alicia. I'm your security person. I'm going to follow you through your whole project and make sure at the end your app is secure. So I'm your guy or gal. She said guy. But um, she's like, so whenever you need help, I'm going to be there. I'm going to ask you for stuff. I'm going to lead you through this process. And so like by the end of the project, I was like this woman is awesome. And also we both like music. So we went to concerts together, but I have to be friends with everyone. This is the way I am. I can't help it. <laughs> um, but so she, and she, she helped. And when she didn't know the answer, she'd say, I don't know the answer. Give me a few days. And I remember her coming up to my desk. She's like, Hey, I think you need to read this. And she dropped the Microsoft secure SDLC book, which is <laughs> very thick. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hold, like, I don't know if you, they can see us, but I'm holding my head. It's very thick, heavy book. And it was like, boom on my desk and she's like, read this, then you'll know everything you need to know. And I didn't read it because one, I'm dyslexic and reading a textbook is not a fun time for dyslexic folks. Like it just takes forever. But two, I was just like, I have a full-time job. Like when am I supposed to read this, Alicia? But slowly I started learning the stuff in it, whether I meant to or not. And just having her as support, I'd say like, oh, they ran that scanner thing and it found this stuff. What does it mean? She's like, I don't know. Let's go like search online together and find these answers. And I liked that she admitted when she didn't know. I liked that she was so determined. She's like, we can do this, Tanya. 
we just have to try harder like we can. And there, and I didn't understand at that time that there's so few women in security. And so the first security conference I went to, this amazing, amazing woman named Justine Bone was the opening keynote. And she like breathed fire and she was so powerful and so amazing. And I did not understand that my local conference really prioritized diversity, even though it was like 2014 and they had half female speakers and I didn't know that this wasn't normal. I And so then my security team at work had tons of women on it. And I was just like, this is, this is amazing. I so belong here. Um, and I feel like having, um, people that I could relate to that were like me, people admit when they don't know, because I've run into this a lot with security folks where if they don't know, they deny and they blame oh, you and I, make you feel bad. I can't believe that at all. I say very fantastically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of the, the, the aspects, there, there's a bunch of aspects of that story that I like. One is just the initial framing of Alicia coming and saying, I'm here to follow you. I'm the framing of here's, we're going to do this together. It's constructive as opposed to, well, you know, after you write 10 lines of code, come to me and I will stamp it and I will approve or disapprove. And uh, that, that obviously has not worked for the past decades of security. And, you know, just watching you listening to your reaction, clearly that was definitely much more of lighting the fire of learning. Wanna, I, I know we might be getting short on time here, but I want to un unpack some more of that those learning aspects. You mentioned too, just reading through a thick book can be a little bit boring, which I say with a, a small tear, having written some books of my own, but you've done a lot of training, live training courses. What are some uh, some additional mechanisms of training, ways to engage different types of learners that you've seen uh, be successful over the time? Um, so like I said, I'm, I'm learning disabled, I'm dyslexic. So when I learned French, I went to the special French school for dyslexic adults and they explained to me there's 21 different ways for people to learn. So when I did my academy, I tried to do as many of those 21 ways as I could. So I would make it so that you could see, so that you could um, you, you could try the thing out, you could read it, you could hear it, you could see the code, you could see an example, you could see there's, there's a quiz and try to have as many different ways as I could so that pe people could learn who don't necessarily all learn the exact same way. I also try doing things like in smaller bite-sized pieces. So all of our videos are generally like five minutes or less on purpose. Uh -huh. I also try to add a lot of humor. So I was a professional entertainer for um, 17 years and I briefly did comedy, but mostly I did music. And so I try to make people laugh. I try to make it fun. I try. I also um, take a lot of tiny breaks. So it sounds weird, but our brains are a bit like a bathtub. You know, imagine we have RAM and then we have a hard drive. And so we have short-term memory and long-term memory, but that short-term memory gets really full and we need a break so that that information can go down into our long-term memory. So it sounds silly, but I have all of these silly memes in my training and I tell everyone in advance, like we do this and I, I have you have a little laugh and we take a little time, we make fun of, you know, an SQL union or whatever we're teasing about because that gives your brain the time to put that short-term memory stuff into your long-term memory so you've actually learned it rather than just memorizing or, you know, it briefly flowing in one ear and out the other. And so I feel like if we have more educators in our space rather than just really, really brilliant humans that are subject matter experts. If we could have both in the same person or have two of those people work together, I think that then we could have a, a lot better experience for a lot of learners in our field. Absolutely. A confluence of, of skills that comes through education, communication, entertainment, as you said, let alone just good writing skills, good speaking skills. But speaking of breaks, I know we're going to have to take one real quick and let you go, Tanya. But is there any, where can people find you next? Or is there, are there a good, uh, you know, parting phrase, whether en français or not, that you'd like to leave <laughs> us all with? Um, please consider joining the WeHack Purple community. It is free. We don't sell anything in it. We have free courses, we have events, we have conversations. Sometimes we just hang out and recommend sci-fi books to each other. Um, if you want to learn AppSec, we want to help. And it doesn't cost anything, which is pretty magical, right? Because um, a lot of things cost a lot of money right now. And if you want to find me, just look up She Hacks Purple, all one word. I have a website, a YouTube, a Twitter. I have all of the things. So if you look that up, you've definitely found me. Um, except for shehackspurple.dev. Uh, someone has has taken that and um, it's weird. That's not me. Well, I mean, like the articles seem all right, but it's not me. Um, anyway, so thank you so much for having me, Mike, John and Joe. This has been really a blast. 
Yes. Well, and thank you for being you on this episode. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely be following you to that seventh continent because I'm very curious about what whatever topic you'd be presenting on that one. So thank you very much, Tanya, once again. Thanks, John. Thanks, Joe. Thanks to all the listeners. We're going to take a quick break and return with news of the week. 